Well, good morning, everyone. Trust. And so let's take a look and see where this trust shows up in the Gospel of Mark. If you would stand for the reading of God's Word, and I'm asking that you would read with passion and inflection as we take a look at this story. You know, when I turn my clicker off, it doesn't work. And sometimes when I turn it on, it doesn't work. Okay, so you read in yellow, and I'll read in white. As evening came, timing, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. Wait a second. Where's the yellow? Hey, so I accidentally put my teaching part where the scripture reading was. This is great. I'm a professional. Okay. Is there a yellow? You know what? I don't know what happened to my yellow. It was there last night. All right. So I'm going to read one verse. Y'all read the next verse. And we'll go with that. We're, we're really flexible here. Okay. Good. I'm going to start all over. Okay. As evening came. Isn't this great? You're expecting, like, let's get into this. <laughs> Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. That's what I'm talking about. Listen to that passion. I love it. Thank you. But soon, a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the waves. Silence. Be still. Suddenly, the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other, even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, you may be seated. Lord, help us to understand. Help us to press into this trust that is foundational for us to be like Jesus intends us to be, marked by peace. The peace that isn't like the world gives. But this peace that Jesus gives, that's not temporary. The peace that lasts. Lord, let us be marked by peace because undergirding all of this, we know who you are. And our lives are changed by it. And Lord, when we vacillate, when we fall, when we flail, help us to remember this story. Remember who you are so that we can remember our foundation for the peace that we have in you, Jesus. Amen. There's this part of, of Peter, the book of Peter, it's uh, chapter 3 in the second book of Peter, that he writes this story and he, and he says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And I, and I want you to know that we're not making these things up. We saw these things happen. And why is it important that I tell you what Peter said? Because even though the book of Mark is named after Mark, the guy who penned it, it's church tradition and commonly understood that it was Peter behind the pen of Mark. And these were Peter's eyewitnesses' experiences. And we, if you go back to the first week in the series of Mark, you can see all the relationships that Mark had with the early disciples. And so we see Peter saying, 
We didn't make this stuff up. It was amazing. And in verse, I think it's 3, 18 or 19, he said these, there was this time on the mountain when we heard God speaking to Jesus, God the Father speaking to Jesus, and it changed us. There was this experience that authenticated the work of the prophets. When we heard those voices, when we saw the things that Jesus did, those were foundational moments for us. And so in this story, we're looking at one of those moments in Peter's life, in the disciples' life, that marked them with a foundational understanding that they could be filled with peace, no matter what life threw at them. How would you like to be marked with that kind of peace? You remember where you were in 9-11? You remember... Those, those events were so clear. Some of you remember when Kennedy was shot. Uh, I remember when the space shuttle blew up. What's a, what's a current event that happened recently? Uh, not too long ago, uh, if you were in Israel, you would remember the day that Hamas busted through the border. Every person in Israel, their own personal 9-11. You can go around the world and people can look at those crystallizing moments and they can think through the day in terms of that news event. And I think the disciples could think through their life event. They would remember that just before this event that Jesus had had a full day of teaching. He was teaching from the boat. And then as evening came, after all of this teaching, instead of bringing the boat into shore and getting off with his disciples and going somewhere to get, get, get food or camp for the night, Jesus said as evening came, to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So, so G, whose idea is it to go across the lake? It's Jesus' idea. So they took Jesus in the boat and starting out, they let, leaving behind the crowds, and, and, and there's this random thought that Peter has through Mark, going, oh and yeah, there were some other boats around us too. They were there. But soon a fierce storm came up. And high waves were breaking into the boat. You can just imagine Peter is, is, is sharing the story, recounting with the disciples. He's like, and then you'll never guess what happened next. It's like this fierce storm came up. And just for context, to understand the Sea of Galilee, if you Google Gal Galilee, you will find out that it is the lowest freshwater lake in the world. And so it makes it very unique. This lake, it's probably about 7 miles by, by uh, 13 miles, 8 by 14, somewhere in there. And, and it's a low 700 feet below sea level. And it's got hills on one side that, that, that are going up maybe, maybe on one side maybe 2,500 uh, feet. Uh, on another side, 1,000 feet. So, so this warm air, can, this cold air comes down the mountains as the sun is setting. And it mixes with the warm air over that lake. And this squall comes up. And, and this is a, such a shallow lake. It's about 150 feet deep. In some places, maybe max of 200 feet deep. And so have you ever churned up a kiddie pool? Right? Not hard to do, right? And the kids love it. Okay? In this case, the disciples didn't love it. Okay, there's this storm that comes in so fast. The sun's setting. It's, the sun's going down. This cold air starts coming in, mixing in with the warm air. And these boats around this time, they're fishing boats. And so if you ask me what like a Toyota Camry or a, or a Ford Explorer is like, just I say, give me the years and I'll explore it. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean that. That was not intentional. Pardon the pun. Um, and so you kind of you get an idea about the model. Okay, my, my, my great-grandfather had a fishing boat on a fjord in the Bergen, in Bergen on the Sogne Fjord in Norway. And, and it, was a, it was a kind of fishing boat that everybody had. And, and back in that time, these fishing boats, the common fishing boats that the disciples probably had, from what we can tell from archaeology, is this was probably about maybe a 20-foot a boat, maybe a 24-foot boat. It's not long. It's, it's maybe about eight feet wide. It might have a, a spot in the middle where about four people could row and they have a mast there. And there's the front and the back and it's only about four and a half feet deep. And it holds maybe about 15 people max. So throw the disciples in there, that's 12, plus Jesus, that's Baker's Dozen. And, and, and you've got a really weighed down boat. It's, it's, it's kind of taking a lot of weight. Now, it can still take on fish, all these kind of things, but it's kind of riding low. 
And so this big storm comes up. It's unexpected. And, a, and, and these high waves are breaking into this little boat. And it began to fill with water. Some of you, if you're good with your imagination, put yourself in the boat. How are you feeling? Are you terrified? The water is spraying in you in the face. I don't think that they have all these buckets in the boat. Maybe they have a bucket in the boat, but they're just right, trying to bail. They're being filled with terror. They have expert fishermen. And so they're kind of used to storms. But what about the tax collector and the zealot? Are they used to it? I don't know if they got swim lessons. But this isn't just any storm. This is a fierce storm. The water is filling the boat. How are they feeling? Terrified. So before we move on, whoa, whose idea was this? This was Jesus' idea. And some, so contrary to popular belief that when you trust Jesus, everything's going to be smooth sailing. That is not the Christian life. It is not the Christian experience. When you step into obedience, the disciples obeyed Jesus without hesitation. They did what he said and they went where he asked them to go. And there's going to be times in your life where you feel like, I have prayed about this. I have asked for good counsel. I've had good advice on this. And things are going bad. Things are not going my way. They're not good. They're hard. I made this decision. And now I am in rough seas. Remember we said last week that promise that Jesus made that if you trust in him, everything will go rosy? Yeah, you're right, right. No, because he never made that promise. He said, in, in this world you will have trouble, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Amen. And I don't know what you're going through right now or what you have gone through or what you're going to go through. Some of you in this room, I know one of you had a stroke and now the other one is going in for a biopsy. And it's a lot. And others of you have struggled with cancer or maybe struggling with cancer now. Some of you may be working, looking for a job and there doesn't seem to be anything on the horizon. Some of you are, are wrestling with issues with your children. And you can't see to the other side of the lake. You're in the storm and you're not sure what's going to happen. And life is filled with this uncertainty. And the waves are crashing in the boat. And the boat is filling up with water. And you may feel like you're going to drown. And maybe you're filled with fear. But you look around the boat. And you're not alone. Because everybody else is freaking out too. They're all terrified. They're all going, what's going on? They're bailing as fast as they can. But this was Jesus' idea, so he's had a tough day. Let's let him sleep. At, so they took the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind. The other boats followed. This fierce storm comes out. It begins to fill with water. And the waves are just about to take this boat down. At least that's what it feels like. So Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Isn't that a nice detail? <laughs> this, is a this is a human detail about Jesus because we, a lot of times we think Jesus was just only God or we think about him as only man, but Jesus was 100% God and 100% man and he, he was this, this divine mystery who got tired because he had a really full day. And he, he just had demonstrated his sovereignty, his power, his authority over sickness, over demons, over all these things that other people couldn't figure out. Jesus spoke to it with authority. And whatever it was, whether it's sickness or demons, it obeyed him. Interestingly, this is the only time in Scripture that we ever find Jesus sleeping. Did you know that? I Googled it. I did an exhaustive, I did an exhaustive concordance search. I checked it out in the Hebrew and the Greek, and you know what the word sleep means? It means sleeping. 
he was so tired, he could also be interpreted dead. He was dead tired. I mean, he was zonked. And he's resting. So let's just pause there just a moment. What What does that tell you about Jesus? He's tired. Yeah. He's not a morning person? I don't know. Uh, no, he's a morning person because he get up to pray. We see that in other parts of Scripture. Always use Scripture to interpret Scripture if you want to understand the full counsel of Scripture. We don't, just come, we don't come to Scripture in this book with our own ideas because we've been given revelation from God about the stories for, because we need information from the outside in order to see the inside appropriately and accurately, and that's what God's given us. And so we see Jesus sleeping, and, and it tells me, I think, that Jesus has a lot of trust in... Well, these guys are professional fishermen. They can handle a trip across the lake. But even more so, I think he has an amazing relationship with God, his Father. And he's thinking, hey, we created this. This is nothing to worry about. I can sleep in peace. Did you know that Jesus can sleep in peace in the middle of a storm? I think the irony is we can't sleep while Jesus, we can't rest while Jesus is sleeping in the boat in the middle of the storm because we're freaking out. Maybe we forget that he's in the boat. See, we've already heard the whole story. But when you're in the middle of the story, we're in the middle of the story. Maybe you're in the middle of your chapter that you do not like. And you don't see the end yet. But we know how this is going to go. But Jesus is completely trusting his father. And Jesus is sleeping in the boat, completely at rest. Things are going to be fine. Because he's in control. His father's got everything. And there's a, there's a rest about him. And, and, and maybe you're not physically in the boat. We're not physically in the boat like Jesus was there. But right now we might feel like Jesus ascended in heaven. He's asleep at the wheel. <laughs> Jesus got the wheel, but he fell asleep. And he's not really paying attention to what we're going through right now. So the disciples woke him up, shouting. Now, have you ever been woken up by someone shouting? Have you, there's, there's a proverb in the, in the Bible that says, uh, to him who, who blesses his neighbor loudly in the morning, it shall be taken as a curse. Uh, you know, it's no fun to be woken up. But in the middle of the storm, it makes sense. We don't know how Jesus woke up, but here's how they, he got woken up. Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? Hmm. Well, he obviously is either unaware of the storm because he's so zonked out, or he can't comprehend that the boat is filling up with water. He's so tired this water splashing around isn't even phasing him. He must not care. Maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like God doesn't care about what you're going through. But nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Because Jesus came to this planet, fast forward to what we know. He came because he cares. In, in, in another translation it says, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? But we know from John 3 that for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. When you trust in Jesus, when you get up there, you want that peace, you fall into Jesus' arms. You say, I'm betting everything on you. You don't have to have a lot of faith, but you're trusting him that he is Lord of creation. Teacher, don't you care that we drowned? Yes, he does. And he exemplifies it at the end of his ministry when he dies on the cross, paying for your sin, for my sin, the disciples' sin, for taking away that thing that separated us from God, all of our wrongdoings, the way we have violated God's perfect law. And he said, I am going to, in exchange, take all of your bad and give you all of my righteousness and all of my goodness. When God the Father looks at you, he's going to say, that's my beautiful child. And nothing can ever separate you from him, from me. And, and, and Jesus cares. And ironically, in a crazy twist of irony, Jesus is sleeping here, the only time he's sleeping. And then, and then the, the, the storm of sin is going to come against Jesus on the cross. And he's going to weather this storm for them and all of humanity. 
But when he invites his dear friends at the end in the garden of Gethsemane to pray with him just for an hour to support him in his time of distress, what do they do? If you know your Bibles, you know that they fell asleep on him. Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Don't you care that we we're perishing? And Jesus woke up. I don't know what kind of mood Jesus was in when he woke up. But he woke up and he rebuked first the wind and then the waves. Just as he had sickness, just as he had the demonic. And he said, silence, be still. And suddenly, suddenly, Mark loves to use this word, Peter is this person of urgency. It's like immediately, you'll never believe how quickly this happened. And in this shallow lake, the waves and the wind died down. This is interesting because these guys were Jewish and they would have known the Old Testament law. And we remember I, I said in, in, in Peter, he's reflecting back on this, this experience he had with Jesus in, in 2 Peter 3. And he's like, the testimony of the prophets came true in Jesus. And in Deuteronomy, a thousand years before, Moses said, the, the, the Bible says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses, from among you, from your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him. They knew that there was someone coming, a Messiah, who was going to be predicted, who was going to come into the world, and the people needed to listen to him. Listen, listen to what Exodus 14, 14, what does Moses say to the people as he's about to part the Red Sea as the Egyptian army is chasing after them. Have you ever been cornered? Have you ever been put in a really difficult situation? The people of Israel knew what that was like. They were being sought. They're about to be killed. And there's nowhere to go. And Moses stood in front of the people and he just said this. The Lord will fight for you. You will need only to be still. And in the same stillness he commanded the wind and the waves, he shows us from the Old Testament that we can be still and the Lord will fight for us. Listen to Mark 440. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Well, I don't know, Jesus. Did you see those waves coming in? Did you see all? We're, we're soaked. And he says to his disciples, do you still have no faith? This is kind of a hard one. But if you think about it from Jesus' perspective, it's like, what have we already been through? Do you guys remember earlier in the day when I was doing all those things? Oh, you, you realize, you're coming to realize that, that I have authority over sickness and I can heal people that no one can heal. I have authority over the demonic. I, can, I, I, have, I have sovereignty. And, and then when your life is marked with this trust that I can do those things, your life is going to be filled with peace when these other things come your way. Oh, you didn't know I was also sovereign over creation. That there's nothing in this world that can separate you from, from the love of God. Romans 8, write it down and go soak on that this week. Because that's the kind of power that God has. So it might feel kind of harsh. But imagine their shock and dis, dis, surprise when he says, do you still have no faith? And the disciples were absolutely terrified, as I think you and I would have been too. And, and, and they asked this question. And this is, central, this is a central question to the book of Mark. Because it goes about the identity of Jesus that makes him different than any other man that ever walked the planet. Because he was all God and he was all man. And who he is is central to his claims. And if you get this wrong, you'll get everything else wrong. And Jesus is talking in his teaching, and you'll see just at the end of this, just before this story, Jesus spoke in parables to all the crowds because he was satisfying their curiosity because all they wanted was the bread and the healing and the miracles. But to those who wanted more, more was available. And when you recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, he is who he claims to be, the unique Savior of the world, your Savior, your Lord, it changes everything. Because there's nothing that doesn't obey him. And in this case, even the wind and the waves. And you can imagine the disciples began to think back through, rabbi, through, through rabbinical, through the school, that were, the synagogue school. 
And, and, and maybe Psalm 107, 28 and 29 came to their mind. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. And verse 29 says, he stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. Have you ever seen that prophecy? Did you realize that's connected? Because if you went to Jewish school, you might have put that together when that happened in front of you. You're like, oh, that verse we memorized as kids. He just did that. Amen. Wait, wait, what does verse 28 say? They cried out to the Lord. Oh my gosh, who is this? Is this the Lord? Proverbs 30, have you ever seen this? Verse 4. Listen to this in the context. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Whose hands have gathered the wind? Who's wrapped up the waters in a cloak? Who's established the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is the name of his son? Surely you know. Amen. Have you ever seen that? Wow. Write it down. Go look at it. This is so clear. If they would have thought back to the Psalms and the Proverbs, you see the prophecies of Jesus saying this divine God-man came down. He's the Son of God. Something that totally blew the minds of the people of the day and still blows our minds today. Because Jesus came for you. He came for me. And this is the same question we're still wrestling with. So you see the prophecy from from. Uh, of how, how they were expected to get somebody who was like Moses but wasn't Moses. They, they, they see this kind of thing that he can even calm the storm. And then the last one is this looking back to you. There's this amazing parallel between Jesus. And remember we did the series in Jonah about a year and a half ago? Watch the parallels to this. Jonah's on a boat because he's fleeing the will of God. And Jesus was on a boat as he continued to fulfill the word of God. The will of God. Two. Jonah's presence on the boat was the reason the storm arose. Jesus' presence on the boat was the reason the storm became calm. Three out of five. Jonah was woken up but did not call upon the Lord. Jesus woke up and he was the Lord upon whom the disciples called upon for help. Amen? Verse the fourth one, G, Jonah's on the boat in order not to go to the Gentiles in Nineveh. Jesus is on a boat in order to go to Gentile territory. We're going to see next week in Mark 5. Actually, you're going to do the passage after that, but next week, Mark 5. Look at that. <laughs> and finally, Jonah had to be delivered from death, and Jesus delivered everyone else from death. Listen, listen to what, Mark, what Tim Keller says about this. There's this parallel between Jonah, who they knew about, and Jesus, whom they're still learning. Jesus and Jonah are both on boats. They're both overtaken by a storm. The descriptions of the storm are almost identical. Jesus and Jonah are asleep. In both stories, the sailors and the sleepers say, we're going to die. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe sometimes you feel like whatever you're going through right now, you're going to die. But in both stories, the sailors then become even more terrified when the storm was calmed. And these two almost identical stories with this key difference, Tim Keller points out, he's so brilliant, I love this. In the midst of the storm, Jonah says to the sailors, in effect, there's only one thing to do. If I perish, you survive. If I die, you will live. And so they threw him into the sea. Remember that? If you haven't read the book of Jonah, go back and read it. It's just a few chapters. It's amazing. But that doesn't happen in Mark's story. Or does it? The Mark, Mark is showing that the stories aren't actually different when you stand back a bit and look at the rest of the story with Jesus in view. Matthew's gospel, his, his rendition of this account, Jesus says one greater than Jonah is here. Jesus himself makes this connection, and he's referring to himself. He's saying, I'm the true Jonah, and this is what he meant. Someday, I'm going to calm all the storms. I'm going to still all the waves. What are the waves and the storms in your life that you're still waiting for Jesus to calm? Jesus is saying, I'm going to destroy destruction. I'm going to break brokenness, and I'm going to kill death. How can he do that? 
He can only do it because when he was on the cross, he was thrown willingly, like Jonah, into the ultimate storm. Are you, are you with me? Under the ultimate waves, the waves of sin and death. And Jesus was thrown into the only storm that can actually sink us. The storm of eternal justice, of what we owe for our wrongdoing. The storm that wasn't calmed until he swept it away. And he swept that storm away for you. And he swept that storm away for me. And he stepped, swept that storm away for the people you know and love. And if the sight of Jesus bowing his head in the ultimate storm isn't burned into the core of your being, you'll never say. If, that, if, that's, if, if you see Jesus on that boat in the core of your being, you'll never say, God doesn't care. Because you know you're in the boat with him, and more importantly, he's in the boat with you. Turn your neighbor and say, he's in the boat with me. If you know that he didn't abandon you in that ultimate storm, what makes you think that he would abandon you in smaller storms? The smaller storms that maybe you're experiencing right now. Write this down in your notes. Go back and hang out in Romans 8 this week. And think about God's love for you. You know, it's interesting. I want to end with this. What does Jesus rebuke his disciples for? Their lack of faith. He didn't say, hey, guys, I know there's a lot of water coming in, but can you explain the substitutionary atonement? (laughs) Hey, explain your eschatology and your Christological view on theology and your doctrine. I need to make sure you got your MDivs before I calm the storm. He never shames them for their lack of knowledge. He doesn't say, you guys just don't know enough. He's saying, you guys don't trust enough. And if we want to be a church that, re- that, that is, if you want to be a person who experiences the goodness of God and the richness of his grace, it's not a matter of knowledge. It's a matter of trust and obedience. And if you want to see God show up, We live out the Great Commission by teaching them to obey. And obedience is God's love language. And we reach in, we step up, and we say, God, I trust you. This is scary. This is hard. You know the stuff I'm going through. And at the end of the day, you're going to say, who is this man? This is the man who went into the ultimate storm for you and me. So if you've never prayed this prayer, just say, God, I don't have a lot of faith. I don't have a lot of knowledge, but with little faith I have. I want to confess you as my Lord and Savior. And Lord, you know the storms that I'm going through right now, and I'm going to trust you that you're in the boat. Even the winds and waves obey you. You're sovereign. I want to be marked with peace. The peace that transcends all understanding that will guard my heart and mind in Christ. And then the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ as we trust him. God, we thank you that you are who you say you were. Help us worship you, even as we sing this song. In Jesus' name.